Hello, this is the American Medical Association's Moving Medicine video and podcast. Today, as we recognize Juneteenth, we're talking with physician and social entrepreneur, Dr. Dale Okorodudu, uh, about Black men in white coats, a collaborative effort that seeks to increase the number of Black men in the field of medicine through exposure, inspiration, and mentoring. He's asked me to call him Dr. Dale. Uh, Dr. Dale is the founder of Black Men in White Coats, Diverse Medicine Inc. and Pre-Med Star, and he's the author of two upcoming books and a practicing pulmonary and critical care physician at the Dallas VA Medical Center and is calling in from Dallas. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Well, Dr. Dale, thanks so much for joining us today. I'd like to start with your own story uh, about challenges that you overcame on your journey to becoming a physician. Can you talk about those? And you know, are there moments that stay with you that help to, uh, drive your desire and will make it easier for others? Yeah, so sure, certainly. So first of all, thanks for having me. I'm super thrilled to have this few minutes with you. Um, you know, you say, are there stories? Probably the biggest story I would say goes back to when I was in college. There was one time where I was flying home. Actually, I wasn't flying home. I was flying to a wedding from St. Louis to Chicago. And there was a woman sitting on the plane next to me. I never met her. She sits down next to me. She sees the way that I'm dressed, big baggy sweatpants, a baggy hoodie. That's just the way I dressed when I was in college. And uh, for the whole entire flight, she just criticized me, said I couldn't speak well, couldn't talk well. And long story short, she told me that I wasn't going to be successful. And I remember leaving thinking, is that what people think when they see individuals who look like me? So that's really been a motivation for me over the years. Well, uh, that's a tough story. And you've kind of leveraged that kind of learning and stories like that to help inspire more Black men to pursue a career in medicine. Can you, can you talk about how you use storytelling and elevating these kinds of stories to, uh, you know, as part of a key part of your strategy? Yeah, definitely. So storytelling is, is huge. It's huge. So people need to be able to see what other people have done in order to believe that they can do it, especially when there's few people that look like them in a certain field. So when we can show profiles of successful black physicians, you know, man, woman, whoever, show these profiles, we help inspire the next generation to say, hey, look at their story. They're like me. If they can do it. I can do it also. What's the best way, you know, most effective way of storytelling in your in your in your book? I was going to say, but how do you how do you do that? Uh, we just let people tell their own story. You know, I think oftentimes. Society gets caught up with trying to tell other people's stories. You see in the media, we want to tell somebody else's stories. That's how you get rumors and tabloids. We say, hey, tell us your story. We're going to show it to the world. We're going to depict it in a beautiful way, but it's going to come from you. So that way people can hear your challenges, your experiences, and then they can better relate to it if it comes directly from you. So you've got the storytelling component. And then a second component on top of that is the mentoring part. You know, exactly. that's a harder part to scale. Uh, you know, across a, a wide range of audience. So you've leveraged technology uh, in a unique way to facilitate this. Can you talk about how you're approaching men? Sure. Yeah. Now, you know, post COVID era, everybody's on Zoom and such, and everybody's getting used to the technology. But, you know, when we started, I started a nonprofit um, over 10 years ago now, and the whole idea was web-based mentoring. So we've been doing this web-based stuff for quite some time. So we do a lot of web-based mentoring. We have a website, diversemedicine.com now, which allows, um, it's kind of like automated virtual mentoring where it allows you to find a mentor and we give you a mentoring curriculum. Um, the other thing we do is quarterly mentoring luncheons. So actually we have one in a few weeks coming up. We have hundreds of students, kids, parents, and doctors on a big webinar thing. We break up into little groups and we let the students have a chance to sit down virtually and have a mentoring while they snack on some lunch at their own house. What, you know, what does mentoring look like in this paradigm that's different from the way that someone might imagine one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Yeah, um, you know, with technology, the great thing about it is it really does allow you to scale like, like what you said. So while it's important to have that intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship with mentoring, you know, when you're trying to get more black men, black women, people from undeserved um, communities into the field of medicine, sometimes you have to go more than one-on-one. -on -one. So the technology, the difference is it allows us to do more than one-on-one, -on -one, but still be effective, still be effective. So that's what we're really focused on is how can we take the few physicians we have who are willing to do this mentoring and to be consistent in it, and how can we amplify their voices and let them reach more and more people? And technology, like you said, is what's allowing that to happen. How's the, like, the social network aspect fit into this? Yeah, so um, our website, diversemedicine.com, has its own social networking aspect, but also you talk about Twitter, Instagram, and such. It fits in perfectly because now you can just put pictures up online and bombard 
the internet with images of black men, women, you know, anybody who from a marginalized community, put them online and say, hey, look at us, we did it. Look where we came from, we did it. And you get to show people that, hey, we did it, you can do it too. But the other thing Todd to recognize is we get to show people who might not believe that we could have done it, like the woman on the airplane. So she gets to see somebody like me now in a white coat to say, hey, you know what? I didn't think you could do it, but look, he has done it. So it changes their perceptions as well. Dr. Dell, what do you think, you know, you've done this amount of mentoring. Do you get kind of a common set of questions from folks or, or a type of wisdom that uh, is most commonly asked for? Um, yeah, I mean, goodness, there's there's so many common threads and really it's all, the, it's all the same stuff. I'll say what the hardest one is, which I still haven't quite figured out, um, it comes down to resources. So the hardest thing, which I think we as a community society needs to figure out to improve healthcare for everybody is for those individuals who can become doctors, but don't have the resources to get there, how do we as a society help do that? So one of the things we focus on, we focus on finding ways to provide those resources. We partner with organizations, we pay for MCAT. You know, we do all sorts of things like that to help individuals get these resources. Well, you've uh, spoken of a, quote, wake up call that led to the development of black men in white coats. Can you talk about what that was and why, you know, it was so important to act on it, especially, you know, at this time? Yeah, so that wake up call for me came in the year 2013. The report came out from the AAMC, said so the number of black men applying to med school was less in 2011 than it was in 2002. Now, a bigger report has since come out saying it was less in 2014 than it was in 1978. But that was a wake-up call. That blew my mind. I thought there was no way that that could be possible. Why, you know, we invest so much money in this. Why are the numbers going down? Um, so we knew we had to do something. And I didn't have much, I didn't have any resources myself to do it. So we simply started it by getting a cell phone. I propped it up in my wallet and we filmed a little 30, 45 minute video. <clears throat> Excuse me. We called it Black Men in White Coats. And that's how all this started. And you know, we weren't intending for all this to happen, but it snowballs into something that's having you know quite the effect now. Do you have any insight as to you know why that's the case that we would see kind of that reverse progress, so to speak, in in this arena? Yeah, so a lot of things, uh, quite a few reasons. Um, one reason I'll say is the way society has portrayed black men in the media throughout the 1990s. The if you look at the 1990s, a black man was not portrayed, <clears throat> excuse me, in a very positive light in the 1990s. So that puts bias in people's minds. That um, gives low expectations to black men. You've heard the quote, the soft bigotry of low expectations. A lot of black boys, you know, we had to deal with that throughout the 1990s, and early 2000s and such. So society really, it's hard to say society was really rooting for the young black man throughout, you know, the 1990s, early 2000s and such. Um, the other thing is the numbers for black individuals as a whole was going up. So we thought the good things were happening, but what we came to realize was, it's because black women were going up significantly, but black men were actually going down. Well, you've produced a documentary that you're going to be screening in medical schools and other institutions around the country, including at the AMA. Can you tell us uh, more about it and what you're hoping to accomplish with it? Yes. Yeah, so first of all, uh, you know, thank you to the AMA for partnering with us on this. AMA will be having you know hundreds, hundreds of screenings across the country, and and we've already had probably close to a thousand screenings across the country, medical schools and such. And really, we just tell the story about black men and white coats, the lack of black men, why that's the case. And we try to provide solutions for how to make it better. And simply all we want to do is encourage people to take action. That's it. Encourage everybody to take action however they can. If you're a physician, hey, maybe I can mentor somebody. If you're a dean of admissions, hey, maybe we can we can um, do some training for our admissions committee. We want everybody to take action to whatever capacity they can take action to themselves. And let me make sure I add, if you're that young black male, hey, I'm gonna take action by making sure I've got my own acts together for my grades and such. We wanna make sure everybody is accountable for their own you know, input in this in solving this problem. What are you hearing back from the people that have uh, watched the documentary? Oh my goodness, this is phenomenal, Todd. So I didn't think it was gonna be this great. It's been really phenomenal. I mean, we have over a thousand reviews. It got to be so much, I stopped checking. Um, five over a thousand five-star reviews. Um, so, so much that I stopped looking, but it's, you know, things like, you know, people's lives being changed. We're getting, we're getting feedback from CEOs of healthcare system, from presidents, from deans. Um, people are really being inspired to move, to take that action. And, and that makes us feel good because that was the exact reason why we made the film. Well, that's got to feel uh, really good. If you, uh, uh, for medical schools that are interested in hosting or participating in the screening, where should they find out more information? Um, so they can go, I believe the AMA will actually have uh, information on your website, so they can go to the AMA website, and then they can also find out more by going to bmwcmovie.com. 
Uh, and that URL would be ama-assn.org slash black men dash white coats. Um, so uh, check that out for more information and have a screening at your school. Um, you know, is there anything else that you wanna make sure that young black men hear, you know, uh, either from physicians or other role model models in their lives? Um, you know, I just, wanna, I just want everybody to understand that first of all, you can do this no matter what anybody tells you. I think back to the woman on the airplane for me again. And um, by the grace of God, I, I had been raised in a way to know not to believe what she was telling me. So you can do this, the first thing to know. Um, second thing is, we're here to help you. AMA, you know, doing this interview with me because they want to help. We want to help. WMC wants to help. There are a lot of programs across the country that wants to help you. And the third thing is, you know, I want to challenge every individual to be accountable for their own success. So it's your dream. It's your vision. It's your future. You have people willing to help you push as hard as you can to achieve it. Well, I'm really glad that you didn't listen to that person on the plane and that you took that experience forward uh, to where you are and, uh, and how you're paying it forward, so to speak, by encouraging uh, Black men to enter the field of medicine. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Dale, for being here with us today. That's it for Moving Medicine uh, podcast and video. For more great content from the AMA, please subscribe or visit ama-assn.org. Thanks for being here today and sharing your important work, Dr. Dale. Uh, the AMA is very, very proud to support Black men in white coats and is committed to increasing medical school admissions among historically excluded and marginalized groups. And once again, ama-assn.org slash Black men dash white coats for more information. Thanks again.